As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long, and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Here at Sway Group, LinkedIn is a pivotal part of our day-to-day and is just absolutely vital for building relationships with clients and with our employees. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. You have less than one month left to get special early bird pricing for the Creator Economy Expo 2023. This event, folks, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses. Do not miss this show. Join over 500 bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, consultants, and freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Plan to attend May 1st through the 3rd in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now to secure early bird pricing before it disappears March 31st. Early bird pricing ends March 31st. As a special offer, you can get $100 off just for listening to MPN shows like this one. Go to cex.events to register. Use the coupon code MPN100. The address, the URL, cex.events. That's the whole thing. Type that into your browser. cex.events, the code you use, MPN100. The Creator Economy Expo, Cleveland, May 1st through the 3rd. See you there. Welcome to The Art of Sway. This is a podcast that brings you inside the world of marketing through the lens of influence. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, through candid conversations with industry insiders, we will uncover how influencer marketing is making an impact across all consumer buying habits and is changing the way we talk to each other. Let's dive in. Sarah Penna has been at the forefront of supporting and creating successful content for the last 14 years. Prior to joining Patreon as its senior manager of creator partnerships, she co-founded Frolic Media, a company telling female forward love and romance stories. Sarah also co-founded Big Frame, the first digital-only talent management firm. She helped to establish Big Frame as an industry-leading media and talent management company with 300 talent signed who have a combined 70 plus million YouTube subscribers and a total social media reach of 200 plus million followers. Sarah's role at Patreon is to lead the launch team responsible for launching creators successfully on the platform. Sarah Penna and I met years ago when Sway was just in its infancy and Sarah was making a huge impact in the YouTube space at Awesomeness. I loved catching up with her and learning all about the membership model of creator monetization. We think this is a huge trend in the creator economy and one that is just going to grow bigger this year. Enjoy the discussion. Well, hi. It's so nice to see you again. It's been, I think we just figured out pre-recording that it's probably been eight years since we saw each other's faces. Yes. Yes. Which is shocking. I, of course, have known you for a while, but I thought it would be great to start off by having you give the audience just a little sense of your journey because it's super interesting. You have really been at the forefront of just the creator space, especially video, really since its beginning. And I thought that your, I just remember you telling me the story, I guess it was now eight to 10 years ago, about how you got started. And it was very interesting to me then. And you've, of course, added more exciting things after that. So why don't we set the stage and have you kind of take us through how you 
got where yeah, you are. absolutely. As you mentioned, it was a very non-linear path to get where I am. Uh, I started out in reality TV in sort of that like 2006, 2007 time period, which was kind of like the heyday pre-writer strike. It was super, super fun, but definitely re- realized it wasn't for me and started seeing people uploading video to this new thing called YouTube. And I ultimately got a job at Al Gore's TV network called Current TV in San Francisco. Many people do not remember this, but it was a really experimental ahead of its time uh, TV network where you could upload short documentaries onto a website and we would buy the ones that we felt were the best and then we would put them on a TV network. And it was really cool. And then the 2008 recession hit and everyone got laid off. We were supposed to IPO. Instead, everyone got laid off and they sold the network to Al Jazeera. But out of that kind of journey, I decided, you know what? I really liked the web side of the TV convergence and kind of leaned harder into the YouTube space. Wound up getting hired by, at the time, the, he was kind of between the number one and number two most subscribed channel in the world, Phil DeFranco, and kind of learned the YouTube, that sort of early YouTube era model of brand deals and AdSense and wound up leaving, working with him to start my own talent management company, Big Frame. The very short version is essentially raised a little bit of venture capital, ran that for for four years with a co-founder, sold it. Sorry to interrupt you, but no, that was okay. really, or just to like set the stage for people like now MCNs, these multi-channel networks for those who don't know, like have been around forever and it seems like they probably already existed and YouTube is super mature at this point, but like that was really early and kind of very forward thinking of you. It's like that wasn't a thing people yeah. were doing, right? That's true. It was, it's funny because I never, I didn't set out to be, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I just, like many entrepreneurs journeys, I essentially like went around and was trying to get some YouTube friends of mine management and agents. And I got essentially laughed out of the room. Like, what are we going to do with these guys? So I was like, well, I think I can do this. And, um, you know, that sort of like, arrogance that comes with naivete (laughs) was like, how hard can it be? Um, It's really hard, but we built up something really special and always took this very creator first mindset with big frame and never scaled to the size of like a maker or a full screen, but ultimately had a successful exit. We sold to DreamWorks in 2014 uh, while I was six months pregnant, which was such a journey. And then they folded us up into Awesomeness TV, where I worked for three years, where we met as I was running this vertical for them that was sort of targeted at new moms, millennial moms. I left there in 2017 and went and started a more kind of traditional media company that was, the focus was taking romance novels and optioning them for film and TV and podcasting. And I love, we never really talked much about that, but- it's, I mean, I think especially now with Book Talk and all these, like my business partner um, shared with all of us, like gave us the joy of Tessa Bailey while we were oh, at yes. a leadership retreat. And now we all have jokes about sexy fishermen. And, <laughs> Love I mean, that book. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> we actually optioned that book, which is so fun. So really? yeah, <laughs> for all oh, like gosh. option that book. So yeah, we had. They were all teasing me because my husband asked for this this will come out after Christmas. I'm not giving anything away, but he asked for this like really big kind of fisherman like sweater for Christmas. And they were all like, we know why. (laughs) I love it. Honestly, we could do a whole other podcast too about romance. I think it's such a fascinating space. I'm obviously a huge fan and it was really fun and interesting to kind of dive into a world that I wasn't as familiar with in terms of optioning books. And I I had a co-founder who comes from the more traditional Um, film and TV space, Lisa Berger. And we did that for three years. I mean, two of which were during the pandemic. So it was really challenging and and the company is still existing and still thriving. And we have books under option. And I had this opportunity to come and work uh, kind of more connect back in with the more traditional, or I guess, I guess it's funny to say more traditional creator space, but the creator economy, I kind of saw it flourishing. And really that's where my heart is so had this opportunity to come work at Patreon and just couldn't say no because I so deeply believe in the mission of what 
Patreon is doing. I've now been at Patreon for a little over a year running our creator partnerships team. So that was not very succinct, but that was the journey that I have been on so far. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot to cover. Yeah. Now, I always say that I'm an accidental CEO and I like never had any intention of starting a business and I, I saw a need and there was something I wanted to do and I just did it. Like, I don't know that I could go through that again. So the fact that you've gone in there a number of times is very inspiring. Or maybe you're just crazy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that I, I looked at my husband when I took the Patreon job and I was like, remind to me that I don't want to start another company. Like, please remind me because I have all these ideas. And I see all of these things happening. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I could do that. I it is incredibly hard, as you know, sort of being the sole decision maker for for a long time, an extended period of time can be very exhausting. Yeah. And isolating. And it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Yes. All of the things. Yeah. So I wanted, I'm really interested in talking to you about this new model of creator compensation, this subscription model. I saw you commented on my LinkedIn Last week, I was sharing like our predictions for 2023, and one of them is really the rise of the subscription model for creators. I'm old school food blogger person, so most of my subscriptions are food bloggers, but there's a lot of them, and they're kind of expensive. And so, like one of the things that really fascinates me is just it's so early on in this kind of way of compensation and I see it growing so tremendously but yet at the same time I kind of wonder how is this gonna pan out it's not like a Netflix necessarily where you get a whole number of shows it's like each creator is Netflix Hulu each one costs its own amount of money and it's a significant amount of money especially when you start adding them up so I'm so curious to talk to you about like where you think this is going and how it's going to evolve because I think it's great for the creators it just gives them this level of control over their own monetization that has not been there yeah I think well first of all Patreon is I think we're nine years old eight or nine years old now Jack and Sam who started it have been at this for a while and I think but to your point I think it's just starting it's sort of like the podcasting industry as a whole right it's been around for a long time but it's just starting to kind of enter mainstream consciousness. And we're really here to enable long-term success for creators, right? I think we talk a lot about sort of being beholden to an algorithm or like having gatekeepers for your monetization. And we really believe that if a creator is right for membership, and not every creator is, that it is the best way to have that direct one-to-one -one connection with your fan base. I think as you're seeing the chaos over at Twitter, for example, a lot of creators whose main contact with their audience is on Twitter, that's a really scary thing to suddenly realize this could go away overnight and I could lose everything. And it's kind of a tale as old as YouTube, right? Where it's you're renting your audience from these platforms. Today, it's end of December, and I just saw the news that Auburn University shut down TikTok because of yeah. state laws now banning it. That's terrifying. Yeah, exactly. And and by the way, it always has been. I, I mean, even building Big Frame on the back of YouTube was a very tenuous business model that we all were very uncomfortable about because they could change their mind at any time. They could say suddenly, no, well, MCN's. We don't want them to exist and pull the plug on the whole thing. And we certainly had moments where things changed and we had to adjust like large portions of our business. We have two things happening in the creator economy. One is this awakening and this realization of, of renting your audience versus owning. And this realization that it's really hard. There's a lot of talk about burnout, right? Part of burnout is not knowing where your income is going to come from or how much it's going to be. So you could make, as a big creator, six figures one month and then for four months make nothing or make a couple thousand dollars. That kind of lumpiness is very stressful over the course of many years. I mean, I'm married to a former YouTube influencer yeah. and trust me, it is like feast or famine. Well, I was just going to say like we've been a couple of the episodes from season one were with former 
mom bloggers who were part of the Sway roster when we started. And I mean, no surprise, they both moved on to other more dependable streams of income because it's it's a hustle. And to your point, it is feast or famine. It's up and down and it's it's difficult to maintain it in the long term, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think you bring up a, a valid point of if everybody has a subscription, is are we going to get into the same scenario of like the pie suddenly becomes a lot smaller? The pie becomes bigger, but the slices become smaller, right? And yeah, that's what you yeah. see when YouTube, for example, like opens up monetization to everybody versus there used to be, you know, you had to be selected to be in the partner program. Okay, your CPMs were high. Now suddenly CPMs are spread out across millions of channels and the slices of the pie just get smaller your CPMs go down, but YouTube makes more money. You know, we we believe that, you know, there's room for, for this space to grow exponentially and the value that you're getting. Yes, it is different than a Netflix, right? But you are getting more intimate connections with your audience. Um, your audience is getting to connect with each other in a less toxic and public environment, Um like Discord, for example. I saw someone on Twitter talking yesterday about like this idea of people are craving more kind of like fireside chat moments and less like stadium moments, right? So like if Twitter is the stadium, Discord uh-huh. is like the fireside chat with your favorite creators. That has a lot of value. I mean, it's like the old school blog comment areas. Like that's where we all met yes. each other. And it was it didn't feel like a fire, like it felt, it didn't feel like a fire hose. It felt like a fireside chat. It felt... I mean, even though you'd get an occasional troll and there was still more control over that and you 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 could put your wall around and keep it intimate and just special and really build that community up, which has become difficult. Yeah. I mean, you touched on something so interesting that this kind of nostalgia for the early version of the internet that felt really unique and cool and safer in a way, yeah. in some ways, and less divisive and toxic and just this, we're not meant to consume this much information. I mean, we wake up and you open Twitter if that's the first thing you do, which I have a bad habit of sometimes doing, and you're just like immediately bombarded with information. And I think there's a like a desire and a, a nostalgia for those early forums or the comment section under blogs. And you look at Discord and it looks and feels very much like an early 2000s forum. And people are gravitating to that because that was special and felt valuable and felt you did make friends in that way. And YouTube used to be that too, right? Like when it was a little more of an intimate environment, you'd make friends in the comment section of YouTube. I mean, I've been on the internet for a long time and I have... I mean, I still have friends that I met on an AOL message board about Weimar honors on a Yahoo group for moms due in November of 2001, eGullet, which was like an old food message board forum. I still have friends from there and have introduced, like have built out that community. So it, like, it's super, super powerful in a way that I don't, I don't know that I see anywhere. I mean, not to sound like get off my lawn. No, but I think you're, I think that even the younger generation, the Gen Z is looking for that, right? They're looking for a more intimate connection. We kind of got caught in the middle where we, we got to experience that. And then we're like the guinea pigs for this social media experiment. And now it's like, is there a way to get back there? And obviously at Patreon, we believe that there is, and there's a way of not only creating value for your fans, which is ultimately the goal, but to also give yourself that breathing room and that financial stability, even if it's just covering your rent or you're saving up for a new camera lens or something, like it gives you that yeah. extra kind of stability that you're not that you're not going to see from just being on social media. So what I was wondering is, do you think we're going to see like consolidation with different creators where they kind of form an alliance just to oh, take advantage of our larger pool of people and not have to split that pie so much. To my point earlier that it can be kind of pricey when you, if you want to subscribe to or support all the creators that you love, it can add up. To me, the next obvious step or for people who kind of hit a similar-ish audience to join forces and offer like a joint one. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I could see a world in where, where that's happening, right? Like you're starting to kind of see that consolidation happen and bundling happen with the streamers, but it took us a long time to get there. Yeah. Um, so I think we're still in kind of that early phase of finding out, you know, the who works in membership and who doesn't and and then it do we get to a point where it makes sense to start kind of bundling yeah I'm not sure we're there yet though yeah yeah what kind of resources are you offering to your creators I mean it has to benefit you the more money they make the more money you're going to make the better they are at kind of taking advantage of this type of monetization it helps everyone so I have to imagine that you're kind of offering some kind of support to them. Yeah, exactly. The creator partnerships team exists to, you know, support creators on their journey as they look to build a membership. So we help them. We're we're doing a lot of education out in the marketplace. So outreach to creators who maybe have thought about membership, but haven't taken that leap or maybe haven't even thought about membership. And we can kind of walk them through what it could look and feel like. And then we have a dedicated launch team that are experts on our platform and help can help them set up both on the technical side, but also help them uh, share best practices around marketing, promotion, um, building and setting up their tiers, really getting to know the creator so that they can help them develop the benefits that would make the most sense. And coming at that from this like just deep understanding and empathy. Patreon is one of those few companies that is says they're creator first and really truly is. I mean, our team, our entire team is dedicated to giving kind of a white glove service to the creators that we work with. Now, of course, the majority of creators are going to launch organically on the platform, um, but we impact a certain percentage of them. Got it. Got it. And then you said before that not everyone is kind of tailor-made for membership and certain creators are more appropriate for it than others. Like what's, you you don't have to give me the whole secret sauce, but like what are are some of the clues to follow this new monetization model? Or I guess it's not new anymore, but newer. (laughs) Yeah. As we're seeing the sophistication of this space, the people who you know, I think the original sort of viewpoint of creators was like number of followers equals value. And I think we've exited that phase and we're entering the phase of quality of followers and subscribers equals value. And so a creator who is able to sort of move their audiences across platform and has that just really deep connection, it does, they don't have to be the biggest creators in the world, but they do have to have a very intimate and deep connection with their audience. The sort of modality that benefits or that kind of embodies that the most is podcasting because podcasting has a discoverability issue. And so if you are listening to a podcast, you are really dedicated to finding and listening to that podcast. YouTube obviously is like more uh, rooted in an algorithm. Uh, And so sometimes it's hard to tell how true that audience is. So it really is about that connection with the audience and the ability to move them across platforms. So are they buying your merch? Are they coming to your live shows? Did you start on TikTok, but now you've built your audience on YouTube? Do your fans like deeply care about the kind of content that you're doing? So there's a value of content as well. And it's interesting too, we've had some learnings around like, Sometimes if a podcast is too long uh, and then they put extra content on the behind the paywall, you're like, ah, I'm satisfied, right? You have to have that like right balance of length of content and amount of content and then an audience that has an appetite to, to want more and is willing to build that community. Yeah. There's a creator named Elise Myers, who's a great example of someone who's just we're like- We're big fans of her here at Sway. She's amazing. And yeah. she has, although she has a very large following, but- She has that special, you can tell she has a really special relationship with her fans. They're going to follow her and they're going to come out and they're going to want more content from her. Amazing. And I mean, one of the things that really, I just love the fact that this kind of, that the Patreon model goes across different platforms and it to the point we were talking about earlier with not knowing when something's going to go away or not. It's very special, I think, to be able to say, you know what, this is me, whether I'm blogging or making a TikTok video or doing my podcast, this is my personal brand. And it like, there's just a lot of freedom that 
comes from that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you can't, the freedom piece is so true. Like you can experiment, you can test things out with your Patreon audience before you broadcast it to the world, right? You can have that really unique and more intimate relationship with your fans um, in this context. I love it. Well, this was super interesting, but before I let you go, we end every podcast episode asking our guests to share what TV commercial from your childhood has most stuck with you today. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of TV as a child, but I can still sing this jingle to like, (laughs) I'm a child of the eighties. Okay. There was like a rent to own utilities, like you could rent to own refrigerators and and like washing machines and stuff. Uh-huh. And for some reason, like me and my whole family, we still like know the phone number and the jingle to this like random rent to own company. I don't even know the name of the company. I just know their number. <laughs> and I don't know why that has stuck with me, but that's it. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I always share that mine is like a cleaning product, which is similarly not sexy yeah. at all, but who knows how our brains work, the things that stick in them. So funny. I know. Yeah. I love that question. Well, this was awesome. It was so nice catching up with you and you hopefully too. we don't wait another eight years. I know. Before that I'll is... be like a grandma next time. <laughs> I don't have a teenager. Oh my God. <sighs> good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you. It was so good to see you. You too. To find Sarah and Patreon online, just follow at Patreon everywhere you follow social media. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Please check back next Monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence. I am your host, Danielle Wiley, and this is The Art of Sway. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.